welcome back to Generals and Napoleon. We have a very special guest joining us from the south of England today, Mr. Marcus Cribb, who is a trustee of the NRWG charity, which is the Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves charity. Marcus, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me and uh, great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, Marcus uh, is also, he runs a website called dukeofwellington.org. And if I'm not mistaken, you were the manager of the Duke of Wellington's house for a number of years, correct? That's correct. That's how I kind of had the bug under the surface for the Napoleonic era and was interested in it. And that was a huge catalyst to me uh, getting, you know, walking in the Duke of Wellington's footsteps, seeing part of his private collection, which isn't always there for public display and private rooms and paintings and items and, and talking on a daily basis about the life of the Duke of Wellington. And as you can imagine, that's, that's very exciting to people like us who yeah. love the Napoleonic War and, <laughs> and, and, and holding his, holding his Peninsula War medal and seeing some of the items out of the cabinets. And then, yeah. Um, as we say, you know, you know, COVID happened and I kind of had to spread out the day job into doing it as a passion as well. Um, yeah. Before I went back, I did go back to work there, but, um, you know, yeah. it's, it's an outlet for us people who love our history, isn't it? So. Yeah, indeed. And uh, we'll, we'll get into the life of the times of the Duke here in just a minute. Mm. I do want to talk about the charity, which I am a member of. Um, I paid my 25 pounds. Thank you very I, much. We massively welcome. appreciate that support. You're welcome. And uh what 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 is the purpose of the charity? What 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 are we serving here? Uh, Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Ghost Charity. If you think that the people of the First World War to today are, are well looked after by most nations, um, not just you know UK of the UK, we've got the uh, Commonwealth War Ghost Commission. But for all nations, it's normally where we start to kind of put the line in a, in the sand. But for conflicts and you know all soldiers before that, uh, soldiers, sailors, marines. There, there's not always a structure in place. Mm -hmm. And you will find that often regiments that were in the First World War, they were out in, for example, like South Africa or uh, Central America and you know, mm -hmm. over, overseas, mm -hmm. uh, only really a decade before. And their graves aren't looked after. And some of those could actually be people who served alongside each other. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of think that, yes, we've got to put another arbitrary uh, line in the sand. And we did that as the, uh, the outbreak of the American Revolution. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we're very mindful that we want to be international, we want to be across uh, time areas, and we want to be very uh, open to both the camp followers, um, you know, people who supported it, uh, but certainly want to go this way it's from just the soldiers to the Marines and sailors as well, and mm -hmm. to try to open the door to ideally um, repatriate or bury, um, depending on the circumstances, but as a beginning, do some research into them and respect the graves that are currently there and uh, might be degrading and look after those and open up a bit of the door to the uh, Napoleonic and revolutionary kind of community as well. So, so far, so good. Uh, good. We have good. done a bit of restoration of some graves and we've got a lot in the pipeline and we've got eyes on larger and smaller projects and everything in between. So hopefully it's a really good cause. Wonderful. Yeah, I think it is. And that's why I joined up um, the website. Again, I'd like to highlight mm -hmm. if, if someone would like to join who's listening, it's nrwgc.com, correct? That's correct. And we'll we'll give online talks, lectures, uh, newsletters. And I say your part of your the main part of it is fundraising for these. So your money goes to a good cause uh, where we can do uh, restoration, conservation and research. Love it. OK, thanks so much for that. So let's jump into the Duke of Wellington, or Arthur, as some people may know him, Arthur Wellesley. Um, he, gosh, I mean, definitely one of the top 10 generals of all time, definitely Napoleon's nemesis. Where do you want to start with this uh, amazingly talented man? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, arguably, uh, he always comes off in the in the debate, doesn't it? So uh, Wellington or Napoleon. I know uh, we probably have slightly different views uh, <laughs> and uh, gentlemen can disagree. Right. Uh, and um, yeah, in international history, he really does come up there in, in, in a tops of most lists. Uh, certainly in British military history, he would normally be in a, in a top three, top five kind of list and arguably in the world's greatest. Um, quite. I mean, his background starts at the beginning, uh, relatively... Uh, mundane, one might say. Mm -hmm. It wasn't completely uh, ordinary. He was from minor aristocracy in uh, in Ireland. In the it was Anglo Irish. Um, just want to stress, which is its own its own culture in Ireland. Right, right. Yep. As part of the British occupation, uh, he was born uh, out in uh, in Dublin. 
And uh, it's, there's an interesting background to him because his christening was registered before his birth, which hmm. already kind of starts a bit of myth and debated about his own origins. Right. Um, but, he was the second son, correct, of the family? Uh, well, second surviving son. So he was never going to inherit the main title, which was the Earl of Mornington. Uh, his older brother Richard did that. And uh, so he was sent to school, uh, famously Eton School initially, uh, which is for people, international audience, uh, a, a private school uh, over in the kind of heart of, uh, just outside of Windsor Castle, actually, the kind of the heart of England, and uh, which is now famous for lots of our politicians and prime ministers come from there. And he didn't do very well. He wasn't very academic. And his own mother said he'll be food for powder, e.g. gunpowder. He, <laughs> he'll die in battle, which is not a very caring, mothering thing. But uh, I think that's interesting. He, unlike Napoleon, he didn't really have a good time in school. There's The, the beginning story is quite similar uh, for mm -hmm. the two gentlemen. Uh, he didn't do very well in school. Uh, he was awkward. They said, what do you do, my awkward son, Arthur? Quote. And um, they ended up deciding to send him briefly to Brussels, uh, so he picked up French. Uh, he would have had a smattering of French anyway. But the family wasn't very rich. The, the father died uh, when they, well, Arthur was relatively young and there was a, he left some debts. So he was uh, kind of given private tutorage in Brussels where he apparently picked up French with a Belgian accent. And then they decided to send him to Angers Military Academy in France. Mm. So here you've got not only a, a Brit in France uh, learning, but obviously there's a similarity that he would have been at a military academy in northern France when Napoleon was kind of down the road as such. That's interesting. I didn't know that. And, and yeah. also, you know, you have a, effectively a Corsican in France and an Anglo-Irishman in France. Right. So, right. Right. so they're neither, be, neither of them are fitting into the main place. Right. Uh, Arthur Wellesley, as he was then, born Arthur Wellesley, um, he actually started to then uh, really fit in in Angers Military Academy. They studied things like uh, fencing, riding, uh, languages, um, maths, physics, and mm -hmm. some of the basics of gentlemanly uh, etiquette as well. And he really excelled at things like the fencing and the riding, the riding especially. And he had a little group of friends. He had a dog there, uh, we know. And his group of friends would like a bit of characters that go into town and sit outside the tavern and laugh and joke and would be well known. They wore them. Um, they were all quite smart, you know, military cadet uniforms, and he mm -hmm. did very well. And mm -hmm. they then decided, the family decided that they didn't have a lot of money, but they would purchase him a commission, which was effectively the standard way into the British Army at the time. Right. Uh, the family paid for that. He rose up the ranks quite quickly because of the purchase system. So from mm -hmm. ensign to lieutenant. And he went through different, various different lieutenancies um, before going back to Ireland, never really spending very long with a regiment and actually avoiding going overseas to the uh, what's now the Caribbean because that was effectively thought as being a death sentence with the, the diseases that did so much devastation to our Western uh, regiments because we didn't have the immunity, you know, right. and the vaccines for that. So and again, again, there's, there's a similarity there with Napoleon, who was quite dodgy with his first assignments. He didn't want to go to some of these places that, you know, the French government wanted him to go. He tried to avoid, you know, un unpopular assignments in his early career. Right, it is a bit ironic, that, and it's impossible not to compare these two men, really. Yeah, yeah. The history is intertwined, but they only ever get to uh, about a mile apart from each other at Mont Saint Jean. <laughs> uh, never, they never met. They never met. Yep. The, the history is always going to be in each other's pockets, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so, so, so Wellington's there in Ireland. He's yep. uh, he's helping out the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, Ireland, who's like a governor of the of the you know what's now part of uh, the you know, United Kingdom, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Apart from a quick foray into the lowlands, Flanders, uh, he, he spends then a lot of time in India. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was looking at the Netherlands campaign, which obviously he wasn't in command yet. He was a junior officer or, or lieutenant colonel, I believe. Yes. Um, but it was um, a loss. And it was interesting. He he had a quote that said, at least I learned what not to do. And that is always a valuable lesson. <laughs> It really was. And the Battle of Boxdale, he, yeah, he was a left-hand colonel and, uh, you know, in command of his regiment. And uh, it was, it was a defeat. Not, not, you know, he wasn't in command of the battle, um, right. but your lessons are learned. And uh, he was then quickly sent off to India mm -hmm. uh, from there, which was a huge, uh, like kind of part of the British empire. And also, you know, the British military effort with the British army and the East India company, mm -hmm. uh, most famously, and funnily enough, his brother ends up being governor general of the largest part of, oh. of there. 
So Richard goes out there. And actually, one of his younger brothers uh, ends up out there as well. So there's all of a sudden quite a lot of Wellesleys. Yeah. Uh, they, ch- they change the name from Wesley to Wellesley whilst they're out there. They integrate better into society. And there's a little powerhouse building. And funny enough, Wellington goes from Lieutenant General all the way up to uh, a Major General whilst he's out there. So uh, uh, it's a lot of promotions. Uh, nepotism there, yeah. yeah. Uh, the British the British Empire was built upon nepotism. <laughs> uh, and uh, we was, we was, you know, to, to summarise almost a, a decade-long campaign, yeah. um, he learned a lot very rapidly. Yes, he was promoted um, because of his connections largely, not completely, uh, but he did show ability. He wasn't always a senior commander. He commanded reserves and flanks and divisions and worked his way up. Um, and there were some very talented generals out there as well, and he showed his worth. But he did end up having some of his greatest uh, victories. I'd you know I'd argue his greatest victory, as I say, where he went against numbers that were probably seven somewhere in the region of seventy times his number. Yeah. Uh, where it's impossible to count the numbers against him, uh, the Maharatha army against him, as I say, because there's so many kind of hangers on the, on the opposition. Uh, right. Right. But he he went against them. He forded a river and attacked. And I guess that comes up my first point about Sir Arthur Wellesley, Duke of Wellington, is he was not a defensive general. Yeah, I'd like to dispel that as well, too. Um, and we'll get to that in the peninsula. Where mm. like, clearly, you know, Victoria, Salamanca, there were several, you know, there were several examples where he was not a defensive general all the time. So yeah, Absolutely not. No, he, he was really well-rounded. And I think it will come on to Waterloo. It's because of Waterloo that we, we've got that myth. And uh, he ends up getting quite Ill, Ill in India, uh, to summarise, you know, an important part of his career. And uh, he then asked for a transfer back, kind of been going, I've gone my time. Can I come back to uh, Britain, please? And he's sent back. He's sent yeah. back and he stops off on St. Helena, which you have. Uh, so uh, there's which another comes back to our story here at the end. But uh, so now we're like 1805, 1806 time frame, somewhere in there? Or 18, is... uh, 1805. Um, okay. Very importantly, because he stops off in Whitehall, with the heart of the British government. And uh, he passes in the corridor in an anti-waiting room. Uh, a person you might have heard of called Horatio Nelson. I have heard of him, yeah. Yeah, funny. <laughs> so they meet, I, I would say twice, like two very short meetings. Uh, he, he comes back to basically say, oh, I'm, I'm back. What orders do you want? And Nelson's picking up his orders that are going to send him down to Cadiz and ultimately Trafalgar. Mm-hmm. And uh, they pass. Nelson famously uh, talks about himself for <laughs> a short Shocking. period. Yeah. And Wellington says, um, well, see as he is then, that it made him almost sick to hear this guy's ego. <laughs> they, they part ways, they have their meetings, they come back and somebody must have grabbed Horatio Nelson's elbow and said, yes, you think he only, air inverted commas, you know, won in India and that's second rate. Well, actually, if you look to his career, they've been spectacular victories, you know, don't put down his uh, achievements in the colonies just because they're not Western. But yeah. know, there's, there's a bit of this kind of snobbery that, you know, it's harder to be a European army than a, an Indian army, which isn't really true. And, yeah. and and Nelson then they had another they had another conversation as his second meeting, and Wellington said it was the most interesting conversation he ever had in his life. At this stage, he's he has achieved some great victories, and he's working his way up. Yes, he's brought his way into the army, and he's brought his way up to the level. But once you get to lieutenant colonel, you have to be promoted up from there, mm. and he's done that through a degree of nepotism but also through a degree of ability and his only way up now is to make the connections but also prove his worth okay. and there's a lot of wars coming on the horizon a lot of campaigns and he's got to prove that he's the one to be in command of those oh. um, but he's not that well he's not a household name there are dozens yeah. and dozens of other generals that people will pick above him yeah so let's let's jump to the point of his life that we're going to focus on where he becomes a household name that's the Peninsula War in 1808, 1809, that's when he arrives, uh, I believe, in so Spain. He goes to Spain. Um, he's he's given command of a force uh, in the south of Ireland, near Cork. Uh, they, he goes off very briefly to Copenhagen and the Danish campaign. Uh, and he's given this force in Cork, who they, they think are actually probably going to go to South America. Mm. Uh, they're changed relatively last minute, and they're sent over to, to Spain with... Very rough orders. Uh, Arthur Wellesley is he's never going to be given like the full thing. He's like the expeditionary force commander, and he's right. going to be relieved. They try to land in Corona, at mm-hmm. Corona and uh, the, the Spanish kind of wave them away and just go, "We're not really interested in having all the British here. You're you mm-hmm. ruin you ruin what we're trying to do." Um, <laughs> and he goes down and lands uh, you know, just outside of Lisbon. Lisbon, yeah, and 
Lisbon at the time, well, not Lisbon, but Portugal is occupied by Marshal Soult, correct, of the French army. He's got Marshal Soult, he's got Juno. There's, a, there's an occupying force because the Portuguese royal family have gone off to Brazil. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're, they're our oldest uh, military alliance with, between Britain and uh, Portugal and our very important trading allies built around our mutual love of wine, buying, selling, drinking. <laughs> yes, uh, England's oldest ally, if I recall correctly. It is. It's, uh, it's a medieval alliance of friendship. And uh, it's been going on a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. And uh, legally, uh, Portugal uh, actually declare war on Britain because of the pressures of Napoleon. Uh, but Juno invades anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, they start looting uh, the country. They you know, do start doing some pretty bad things to occupy. And it mm-hmm. turns the Portuguese population against them. And then almost the next day, uh, the Portuguese government in exile starts secret negotiations with Britain. And this is where this expeditionary force comes in. Got you. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I read that, yeah, that the uh, uh, Portuguese royal family flees to South America. So, I mean, the Portuguese people are in need of the British at this time. They're in need of the British. Uh, the Portuguese government then in Brazil open up trading with Brazil to Britain, which is at the time uh, Brazil was only allowed to trade with Portugal. Now, mm. I think all the riches that was in Brazil, effectively, people wanted right. those spices and those and those materials. All of a sudden, Britain having a, a, a bite of that, like trading pie, was mm. really important. And it was a big thank you. And we've then got the Portuguese really on our side. And they, they fit in and they work very well with the British. Um, mm. Wellington's first thing, we talked about him earlier, is he a defensive general? His first thing is he goes on the attack at Relisa. Mm-hmm. He attacks a French force that are on a hill. Uh, they actually fall back. And then Wellington then attacks them against up this really steeper uh, hill. It's, it's really rocky and it's filled with uh, big gullies that are full of rocks. Um, one of the commanders, uh, Colonel Lake, charges up. He's actually cut off. And Wellington's trying to cool him back and do a big flanking manoeuvre. Lake's actually cut off, killed. Well, but Wellington, uh, as well as he was, uh, wins the day. And mm. you know his first his first action, his first full um, fight in the Peninsula War is an attack uh, against a French force that's holding on the hill. All right, so let's mark that down for all our uh, armchair historians. That was a <laughs> an attack against Junot in a prepared defensive position that well, uh, well, the future Duke of Wellington won the battle. That's so. correct. Yes. Uh, he's not the Duke of Wellington just yet. He's not just yet. No, I, I mean, interchangeably, I'm always going to call him Wellington. Um, it's how we know him as. Um, but yeah, he hasn't quite got the full titles yet, just to be confusing. So he's called, he's called Arthur Wellesley at this point. Um, okay. And then he has to kind of turn around just a bit down the coast at Vimero and Juno attacks him. Um, so he's, he's won a victory and then he's on, the, he's on the coast trying to unload effectively. They're about to start unloading the reinforcements, the British reinforcements in. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're starting to come ashore. They're being washed, you know, washed out the boats. It's a bit dangerous. And Juno starts attacking him. And this is where he does have his first uh, reverse slope. So that's where he, he goes on top of a ridge and puts some of his troops behind the top of the ridge so that they can't be shot up by French guns. Yeah. Is, it, Which is, is that something he learned in India or, or is that just one of his own strategy things? Well, a bit of both. What, the main thing he picked up of India is he's learned how to read ground, topography, geography. Mm-hmm. And he's got a really, really good eye of what ground can hide troops, what ground can manoeuvre troops and move them. <laughs> uh, the reverse slope, not so much, uh, but it's certainly, it's not a new tactic, but he's really mastered it. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense. Yeah, and it gave the French fits. They just, they were used to the Prussians and the Austrians just standing there taking cannon fire. That's so, right. Yeah. You know, they, they, often the battlefields would be relatively wide, flat valleys. Uh, the French formed into their, their giant columns, or columns of division or various. And um, the French Ilan, the spirits and the heavy cannon would often win the day. And as a column comes towards the line where lots of these forces had, you know, conscripts in there, the line would buckle and break because the mm-hmm. column hasn't given up. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're protecting your line until the last minute, the, col- the line's strong. Uh, British troops uh, weren't conscripted, um, so they had, and they were known to train with live ammunition, which most armies didn't actually train with live ammunition. They mm-hmm. just did the drills, and they had very good training. They had, we talk about the plucky Brits quite a lot. They've got very good um, kind of morale. Mm-hmm. They think they're the best in the world. Arguably, sure. probably, probably not, but we like to think <laughs> we are, and, that, and, that, and thinking you are helps a long way. Absolutely. So, so the, the French come on and the British see them off, really. Yeah. yeah. And that's a huge morale boost, I'm sure, to the British. Like, all right, we can do this. We can we can make a, a stand and make some progress here. 
And that's it. We were suddenly winning some victories against the French in Europe. Um, and it, it really helps there. The, the problem comes that Wellesley, he wins his victory. And that evening, he's replaced as commander. Oh. And that commander says, let's not follow up the fight. Uh. The, f- the following day, that commander is also replaced. <laughs> so you go in, you go in like 24 hours, you, you change the commander from uh, Arthur Wellesley. to actually, he's been the third in command. So he's no longer really got a voice at the table. And the other two commanders decide to sign a pact with Juno and mm. the Convention of Sintra. Yep. And not and only... They they ferry them back to France, right? Like with all their yeah. of war. <laughs> so not only do they say you can go back to France with your muskets, your colours, your flags, you can take your loot with you mm-hmm. and we'll put you on ships and take you to France. <laughs> so funny enough, there's an investigation into this. Uh, the other commanders don't come back, but um, Arthur Wellesley does. Yeah. I- I'd like to point out, though, and I'll give you a break on this point, the French marshals and Napoleon were not the only governments that bickered with each other and had poor leadership at the highest levels. You know, the Russians, Russian generals argued with each other. British generals argued with each other. It was universal at this time, correct? Yeah. I mean, there's a huge amount of personality. Um, some of the generals, would, you know, write personal things that they really just didn't like their, their colleagues. Mm-hmm. And there's also element, you know, of advancement. You want to be seen to be the one who's in command and achieving fame, glory, you know, honor and the victories. Yeah. What's the old quote? It's a uh, victory has a hundred fathers and defeats an orphan. Something I think like that. that's something like that. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, I hadn't heard that in a while. That's a good one. I forgot. Yeah, yeah. No, it is. And and I think that's interesting. So moving along in our story, um, Marshal Soult, as we mentioned before, is kind of up the road in Oporto. Yes. And even though Napoleon, I think, ordered him to Lisbon, he has been kind of dithering and just laying about Oporto, trying to become king of Portugal. And then what happens? Yeah. So he, he basically actually wants to become king of Portugal. Um, and he's putting that out there that there's the king of Portugal has been effectively dethroned and the throne's up for grabs, effectively. Um, and you know, Napoleon handed out to his marshals, to his family, to, dare I say, lackeys. Um, mm-hmm. but, you know, very grand titles of princes and kingdoms and dukedoms. <laughs> and, and, and very skilled. Marshal Soult was a, a, a good tactician. He was a very good tactician, but he was also a terrible looter. And he starts looting uh, at Porto. Yeah. And... I believe just either Marshal Soult was distracted with his looting or he couldn't believe that the British could could surprise him like this. Or it seems like he was totally unprepared based on his retreat and all the things he had to leave behind. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. This is this is great, basically. So he's looting and he's got huge wagon trains uh, leaving the north bank of Porto. Uh, if you ever get the chance to visit, it's a beautiful uh, city, I UNESCO World it. Heritage Site. Yeah, And uh, it's a really, really wide river, the River Juro down the middle. And uh, these days, there's loads of bridges across it, including a, a beautiful bridge built by Monsieur Eiffel of Eiffel Tower fame. Mm. Uh, at the time, there, were, there was basically one bridge, and that uh, Salt destroyed that. Uh, but it, there, was, it, there, was, uh, there was a bridge that had destroyed during the taking of the city, and then it had been rebuilt, and Salt then ordered uh, that to be brought back, so it was made up of boats. And mm-hmm. they rode it back to the north bank. So you've got the French on the north bank, and the British have moved their way into the south of the city on the outskirts. And Salt basically goes, well, they can't cross the river. I've got all the boats. Right. And he orders all the boats that are either to be broken or burnt. And he says the crossing up north is a long way off, you, uh, well, east, northeast, along the river. So they're not going to come up that way. So that he almost thinks that they're probably going to have to like call in the Royal Navy, jump on ships, and then go back up the coast. Right. So he, he busies himself looting. Uh, he actually ha- has his big lunch and goes back to bed. <laughs> um, some men of the uh, third regiment, the Buffs, uh, they f- they get in a boat, which is found by an intelligence officer, uh, an exploring officer called Major Waters. Great name, uh, yeah. very apt. Who very speaks, apt. Yeah, very apt. And I and believe he, some uh, uh, Port- Portuguese citizens were helping the British. So, yes, yeah, so he finds a a local uh, barber. Uh, you know, does shaving, uh, who says, look, there's a boat on the north bank. He finds then a friar, a priest, and, a, and four men, and they get these boats. They get one skiff, a little punting boat, and then they get four wine barges, which are quite mm-hmm. famous in Porto. And the Portuguese civilians and major water bring it over, uh, just a few of them. And they basically say, look, we're ready to go. We've got these boats. Right. And Wellington lines up uh, Hill's Brigade, Roland Hill's Brigade, 
And Wellens is a micromanager, and that's something I've not touched on yet. He really gets into the heart of the action. He likes to be there. He gives orders down to a minute detail. Yeah. And, and, and I think, again, that's a, a similarity to Napoleon. Like, he doesn't just direct his armies by remote control. He's visiting unit after unit and seeing what's going on in each unit. I think I think Wellington goes on a like a level level of, even above Napoleon. He really he he's on his horse. He gets in, and this is one of those moments he doesn't, and it's really unusual. So he says, "Right, we've got the boats, the the buffs, as they know, the third regiment. They they're going to load into these boats. What do you want to do?" And he says, "Well, let the men cross." So they they kind of go under their own steam. Uh, two companies of men. Uh, the light company. So the, the way the regiments are ordered. You know, there's ten companies: the grenadier and light in that. The light company go over and then a company under a major Wellington. No connection, uh, but a very uh, interesting chance of fate. Yeah. They go across, they, they capture a seminary uh, yeah. and uh, they push the French out the edge of the town. And Salt's informed, oh, there's some redcoats crossing the river. And he thought so there may be the Swiss troops that are in part of this force. And then he starts to hear the fighting. Effectively, there's a couple of waves of attack from the 17th Regiment, then the 70th Regiment. The British give fire covering support from the South Bank, including howitzers that fire mm. shell over. And they push off all of these retreats. They actually find more boats. They go in the city. They find a flanking force that go up river, find more boats. And they push the French out with really light casualties to the uh, British. They capture a lot of French soldiers, including most of their cannon, which is sat in like an arsenal, yep. and thousands of French um, casualties that are actually in hospitals. Want to make a podcast? Spotify has got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money. All one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I've really enjoyed the ease of use and the distribution ability of this platform. So from there, what happens to the French army? They go bounding up to Marshal Ney's camp, correct? Correct. They cross the, they cross the border and they're, they're harassed a lot of the way by the British. They have to fight through Portuguese and Spanish blockades across rivers and ravines. And, uh, you know, there's, there's some great action where the French have to fight across these narrow bridges. And there's some real bravery from the French uh, junior commanders. Mm -hmm. But um, at the end of it, Salt has to spike or uh, double shot his guns and ruin them. Mm -hmm. He has to throw his uh, his gold and his pay chest and his loot uh. down down ravines. <laughs> and, and this army that arrive in northern Spain today, I, I thought it was being like they look like they look like peasant beggars they're in rags they've got no food they've got no money and they, they've gone from being a really rich conquering force in Oporto just about a month before to being near starvation with nothing on their feet you know in, in rags across the, the Portuguese mountains yeah and I I think it's a, it's just a, a credit to Wellington and how vigorously he pursued them that really Sult could barely just get away with his lives and nothing else yeah, uh, that's it. They, they've got they've got nothing from there. Now, uh, what, uh, Wellesley has uh, two options, really, right? If he he can either try things out with uh, Marshal Soult and now Ney, or he can press on toward Talavera, correct? That's right. He crosses the border. Uh, he goes in. He goes and fights at Talavera and works with the Spanish, which uh, Sir John Moore found incredibly difficult because this, you know, the Spanish politics. <laughs> If you cast your mind back, it's only really two and a half, three years previous that the Spanish have fought against Britain at the like, Battle of Trafalgar. Yeah, and I think that's, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that something Wellesley learned in India is how to take, you know, you know, native forces, militias, different groups of soldiers and blend them into one army? Yeah, hugely important that. Um, and that's what he does. He, it's, a bit, it's an important lesson that, you know, we, we still talk about those kind of actions today uh, with Iraq, Afghanistan and recent conflicts and mm -hmm. working with forces on the ground and working diplomatically with them. But and and Wellesley does this really well. 
Yeah, the, the and... Spanish are not easy to work with at this point. I'm going to be a little bit critical of them. And they don't, it's not that they don't want to be there, it's that they want to do things their way and on their terms as a sweeping generalization. Right. And in, in like with any army, like, like we were saying earlier, you know, the Spanish juntas, as they called them, mm -hmm. they had different generalissimos who had different, you know, goals in their minds. So they probably were competing with each other. And then the British, as well as the Portuguese, show up. And now, now there's like three different ideologies in how to attack the French. Yes, yeah, that's it. And, and, the, and the Spanish are quite fractured, as you say. You know, you've got the generalissimos, you've got your junzas, and they, they've got their own regional aims, so they protect themselves. Is it best to, you know, and a few, you know, there, there are the um, Anfrancisados, who are the Spanish who work with the, uh, the French. Right. Now, they're, they're nowhere near the majority, but they're, they're you know, a, a portion of most of the liberal middle class is where they come from. They're thinking about trying to, get decrease the power of the catholic church in spain which has a huge amount of kind of like feudal power right but the church is very important to the spanish culture and people indeed uh, and the, and the french are actually desecrating churches and religion yeah. and they're doing horrible this, this is where the warfare starts to get really horrible yeah and you know looting the churches is only going to turn the natives against you so yeah for sure yeah um, there's there's a horrible case i think it's one of the ones i quote on my website you mentioned that the, the french entered a town and they offered the, the people the choice. We will either, you know, rape and kill your women or desecrate your church. And the, the Spanish thought about it and went, well, we've got to look after the church because it's it's God. And they said, well, if that's your choice, we'll do both. And they, you know, destroyed the, they basically destroyed the village and the town. Wow. Yeah. Um, it, it really, really horrible. And then the Spanish have reprisals, actually the Portuguese too. Yeah. Um, on the approach into uh, Porto, uh, Wellesley actually noticed, and some of the commanders that I'm studying noticed what the Portuguese have been doing to the French who don't keep up with the retreats. And almost some of it's like you can't repeat. It's actually that disgusting. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, this is really brutal warfare. No, I, I read uh, like one French general was lowered into like a boiling vat of oil, you know. Boiling vat of oil. There was a French soldier who was held by each leg and then sawn in half alive. Yeah. Um, and then there's there's cases of, um, of literally the peasant woman um, slitting French throats with butchering knives and stuff like that. Yeah. It really gets hands on. Yeah, and, and indeed, brutal. And and just to give some background this time, um, the person ruling is King Joseph, uh, Napoleon's brother. And he, although he's nominally in command, we know Napoleon's actually in command of the situation from Paris, correct? Yeah, so he's he's directing things. He's he, this this point where it ties in with the, the rest of your your lovely series is he's <laughs> sending down his generals, his his marshals, and as as it will pick up the pace of the story, they get turned over quite quickly. Yeah, they do, and and no fault of their own. I don't think, and we'll we'll touch on this. I don't think they were as well supplied, as ludicrous as it sounds, as the British were. You know? Yeah, I, so we kind of got all the the points to. Well, Wellington's victory. So after Talavera, uh, where he fights in this plain outside um, the town. Which was he's a close run battle, by the way. Victor almost had him. Really close run battle. There's a point uh, the night before the battle that Victor gets to get a force onto one of the British hills and causes a surprise attack. And uh, it's really close run battle. It's very brutal both sides. The casualty figures are both very similar. But at the end of the day, the British, Portuguese, Spanish force are holding uh, the field. Then kind of the wheels fall off after Talavera, right? Like there's some supply problems or they, there's just a lot going on right now. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned supply. Uh, you've got you've got basically like supply, um, intelligence and uh, and the main forces. And it's working with the locals, working with the guerrillas mm -hmm. uh, who have their completely have their own uh, agenda, some of which are like informal troops, uh, some of which are effectively nothing much better than bandits. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, the French are a very a convenient target because they can get away with it. There's some who are deeply religious, some who are deeply patriotic, and a whole mix, some who are opportunistic and just kind of a mix in between. And there'll be regional commanders with no central structure. This isn't like an organized like resistance. This isn't 1940 in France. These, this is regional um, places who probably haven't heard of, you know, or probably never visited, you know, places like Madrid. Right. And uh, the terrain is uh, very hard to move armies over. There's a lot involved here. There's a lot involved. And, uh, you know, the plains of Spain are thought of as, you know, a big spaces that uh, effectively Napoleon says, you know, can starve an army. Mm -hmm. uh, what Wellington's now doing is working with the locals to supply his army. He's got a relatively uh, short supply chain from the from Lisbon across the border. But he builds up depots. He works with locals. And what's really important is he's on, on sweeping jet statements 
buying food from locals rather than looting it like the French are. Yeah, and I think that's a good thing to call out. Um, you know, a Wellesley or Wellington at this time was very by the book when it came to requisitioning. <laughs> Yeah, he's trying to requisition it um, on, on an individual unit basis. The troops are going to go off and steal, you know, bread, chickens, things like that. Uh, but they're told to try to buy it. And that's that's the general rule that they're trying to go by to try to keep the locals on side as best as possible. Uh, when they put troops in a, in a house overnight, they're given a chit, which is uh, C-H-I-T. Um, and they're given a piece of paper, which is effectively they can exchange later for money now it's not really worth a lot is this is this peasant really going to go down to a right. depot in a right. few months time and get this unlikely but in theory they're paying yeah i think and then at least they're making the effort to be legitimate about it so yeah, that, yeah. And, and they're punishing people who perform you know badly to to the locals um and it starts to yeah it, it starts to take effect but La Suesta, who's uh, Wellington's main Spanish ally in the area, he's not working very well, and they're not working in conjunction with each other. Mm -hmm. And in 1810, uh, Napoleon's had enough of this uh, incursion, and he sends one of his best marshals, Massena, down to retrieve the situation. That's right. So uh, if, we, if we fast forward to then, uh, Wellington's tried to get inside to Spain a bit more. It's not really working, so he's back in Portugal. And uh, he's he's pushes forwards and he has an amazing defensive position at and I'm going to butcher my Portuguese here. Apologies, uh, Bucasso or Bucaco. Yes, that's right. Uh, he's got this lovely Spanish inflection. Yep. And uh, I have to admit, if you get a chance to visit a battlefield that doesn't look like a battlefield, it's Bucasso. Okay. So it's a strong like mountain ridge. Uh, I, when I was there, where was I there? Right at the beginning of 2020, mm. I went out there with my father in a little like kind of Fiat hire car, and it generally in first gear could barely get up this this mountain. <laughs> it's so steep, okay. and I just kept saying the whole way, like, imagine you're a French conscript with a pack and leather shoes. Right? How are you going to do? Like, how, how are you, you going gonna... to do this? You, yeah, you don't exactly. you don't have like a a 12 horsepower Fiat. Yeah, you've got to get yourself up this ridge. And yeah. Wellington's on top of this ridge. Uh, it's a very very good position. You can see the French coming from miles away. Mm. They can't see him, but you are going to be absolutely like tired beyond all belief just to walk up this ridge. Never mm. mind fight when you get to the top. Mm -hmm. And what's mm, sorry? Go no, on. no. Uh, and it, 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 in, uh, it's an Anglo-Portuguese victory, but I, I wanted to let you get into the details of it. Yeah, I, I, I'm conscious of your time, so I'm going to summarise. But it is an Anglo-Portuguese victory, and it's really important to stress that Portuguese are there, both with regular regiments and militia, for almost the first full time that they're there as a, a lot of strength. And they're, the British kind of begrudgingly say that they do very well, which is actually high praise. Mm -hmm. And Beresford and some of uh, Wellington's subordinates are training the Portuguese at this time, correct? That's where they've come from, yeah, Beresford. He's, he's, he's remodeled the army because a lot of them were conscripted into the French army. Uh, the French tried to form the Portuguese, but they do form the Portuguese Legion. Uh, over half of them uh, basically desert before they leave Portugal and Spain and end up back in the Portuguese army. Uh, and I give them huge kudos for that, actually. Um, but they, some of them do end up actually as far away in Russia. And I just feel really sorry for them. Mm -hmm. Only about a thousand of them survive. Yeah. You can you imagine the hope coming they come back to go i survived this terrible ordeal but you're going to hate me because i fought for the enemy um so <laughs> kind of a bit of a side note i feel yeah. very sorry for them and uh, yeah beresford's doing a very good job of training up the portuguese he takes a lot of uh, british ncos and junior officers and promotes them into the portuguese force uh, but the portuguese have got their own commanders in there as well and they and they gel really well and you can you kind of imagine that you take like a British sergeant from you know my part of the world and say you're going to get a real crash course in in local Portuguese and I mean you're just going to learn it right by messing with the Portuguese officers but you're going to be commissioned you're now going to be you're no longer a sergeant you're going to be a captain mm. and you're working with the Portuguese and the Portuguese accept this so they've got experienced men working above them as well as their own officers kind of like a 50 50 mm. and it, it works really well Mm -hmm. And the Portuguese stand, they, they, they drill, they fight hard. And you know, like I say, begrudging British respect is hard earned from, you know, grizzled veterans. And right. Picasso is a good victory, but he starts to be outflanked at the end of the next day. Uh, also, including an attack uh, by Ney, who actually they do get onto the ridge of Picasso. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that I think is more amazing than anything else, uh, given its position. <laughs> well, uh, but they, they do get a foot and it's and it's like hand to hand fighting. 
you know, he was the bravest of the brave, Marshall Ney. So, yeah. Um, He's getting up there, but I've got to give it to his men who, who followed him. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but yeah, vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and he's getting outflanked. And then I think the biggest surprise to the French is about to come, right? It is, because no, it's been done in relatively secret. Uh, it's the lines of Torres Vedras, mm -hmm. uh, which is an amazing formation, uh, not so far outside of Lisbon. Uh, two main principal lines, but there's actually a third line as well of formations, uh, forts and trenches. Each one is actually different. Uh, there's not one that's like another. Some are large, like citadels that have been adapted, that would have existed. Others have been dug. Um, they've actually been dug nearly all, all by local manpower, uh, Portuguese that are paid for their service. Uh, overseed by just a handful, a really small handful of British Royal Engineers. Mm. And it's a bit of a military like masterstroke this. And uh, they're not breached. They are attacked. They're not breached. And the French basically starve over the winter outside yeah. of these lines. Yeah, I, I think they were baffled and starved at the same time, the French. And and I think the greatest compliment that could be given is that Marshal Ney took one look at it and said, no way in hell am I attacking this. There, yeah, uh, Ney doesn't try. Uh, there are a few French attacks. Uh, I don't think they have a attack with a full force because they no. just don't. They don't have the belief that they actually could do it. So from there, um, the great Marshal Ney, who's my favorite, as you know, he gives Wellington somewhat of a fit with his rearguard campaign. Correct? He does. Uh, there's a, there's now some relatively smaller actions, and um, yeah, Ney kind of comes off the better hand. Um, it's it's an interesting smaller campaign mm -hmm. um, that Ney does achieve um, some, some minor victories, let's argue. Mm -hmm. And yep. there's a bit of a debate, but I think yep. you can broadly say that Wellington never lost a pitched battle. Uh, but then the rear guards, you know, like Red Hina, you've got. Yep. And oh. yep. the, the rear guards are forced to withdraw at the end of the day. Yep. So, but they, so they achieve their aim, which is to delay Wellington. But then Wellington achieves his aim, which is to capture the field. Right. So there's a bit of a like strategic versus tactical victory debates that goes on. Yep. Uh, but Ney, you know, is is a very very competent general out of out of everyone who faces him. You know, Ney's up there. Yeah, indeed. And, um, and, and Wellington doesn't have isn't able to bring his full force to bear in a rear guard kind of action. He likes to line his troops up and have a bit of like kind of premeditation to that. Right. And then from there in 1811, Messina is uh, considering returning to Portugal to relieve Almeida. Correct. And then. Uh, they have their huge battle at uh, Fuentes de Anoro. That's right. So Almeida, again, a Portuguese fort just inside the border, built to kind of make sure the Spanish don't invade. It's a beautiful star fort. And uh, that's under siege with uh, the French inside and the British on the outside. And uh, Massina tries to get across the border at Fuentes de Uno, which is nothing really more than a small village that's just down on a very small valley with a little rise above it. I, you can't go as far as calling this a ridge. Uh, it isn't. It's just a small rise. A uh, bit of dead ground. And over three days of fighting, but the second day is actually very little fighting, but there's over three days, um, bloody battle. Massina manages to get upon Wellington's right, the French left, get in there with his cavalry, catch the British a uh, bit by surprise. The uh, division uh, then needed to actually be withdrawn out by the light division. Wellington holds the position and fights the French off successively. Yeah, and yeah, you know, Marshal Bessier certainly didn't help anything with his lack of support from Messina in that battle. Um, but from th that was a close run battle, and I think was this the battle where Wellington said if, if Bonnie had been there? Yeah, his, his quote was if Bonnie had beat there, I would have been beaten. Mm. Uh, so it's really close. Massina almost had the day and would probably be out of them all, you know, Wellington's closest uh, to a defeat, but strategically he won. He did hold again the field at the end of the day. Slight um, casualties are very similar, but he holds the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, but he knows he's come pretty close to this one, and he's pushed his luck. He he really kind of underestimated the enemy, which is not something he normally does. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I'll defend him there, so he doesn't normally do it. But in this case, he does, and mm -hmm. you know, he kind of gets his knuckles wrapped by his, his own uh, his own credit. He knows that he hasn't done very well there and is right. necessarily wasted men. And part of this whole like defensive general on a ridge is he's trying to not get men killed right. because he's got the long supplies. He's not, you know, he's recruiting the Portuguese locally, uh, but he, he always believes in the British core to his army and he right. wants to preserve their lives as best he can. Right. And I think that's good. You don't want to be reckless with your men's lives. Uh, no. no. And uh, the aftermath is the French have to then abandon Almeida, the fort, um, and from there, what ha where are we going? Like, 
obviously Masana's kind of uh, going backwards. Uh, Wellington's doing. He goes backwards, I believe. I'm right in saying this is where he's recalled to France, and Napoleon gives him some dressing down. And says you're no longer Masena in front of me anymore. Correct. Uh, which is pretty pretty harsh. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the French managed to actually they slip out overnight. They leave Almeida, and that's then taken back by the British. And uh, then there's two towns along the. Uh, yep. Suda Rodrigo, which is right by uh, Almeida. It's the other yep. side of the border. They're like twins. And then down the border, uh, Badajoz, yep. uh, which is the bigger. So he, he storms relatively quickly, Suda Rodrigo, uh, forces two breaches and goes into the city. A terrible looting takes place afterwards inside. Yep. Uh, and then he turns his sight onto Badajoz. Now, yep. Badajoz's much more difficult. It's over the winter. It's a much bigger city and uh, is better prepared as well. Yeah. Uh, it, it's eventually taken, and uh, it's a high cost on all sides. Now, what happens is on both these uh, sieges, there's a kind of an unspoken rule that when a siege is breached, they're kind of given like, you know, it's breached during the day by cannon fire. Mm. It's going to be stormed probably that evening. Mm. There's the opportunity there, a few hours for the garrison aside, in this case, to surrender, to say, mm -hmm. look, you're going to be coming at us. We're probably not going to win right flag home. Right. Now, neither of these cases they do it. The French uh, defend the breaches. They put in uh, these, they're called fougas, which is like a, a trunk, a tree trunk, where they stack, stick bayonets and swords into it and normally mm -hmm. smear it in like excrement. Mm -hmm. And they put those, they put in some like mines and like booby traps, and they, they prepare to defend themselves pretty much to the death. This mm -hmm. is what they're declaring. That then means that there's an unofficial, and I stress unofficial convention. That, that means the town's opted for grabs. And once you get in, whatever happens, happens. No no, no holds barred, basically. No holds barred. No no, no mercy. Yep. Now, now, that makes a bit difficult situation for the people who live there who happen to be Spanish and are allies and also civilians. Right. So what some of them do is kind of, you know, lock themselves inside. There's a few stories that a few actually put barrels of, like, beer and wine outside their front doors to mm -hmm. be kind of like, when you come in, drink, leave us alone. <laughs> right. But, now, um, Bad uh, Suidad Rodrigo got looted quite badly overnight, uh, but the order was restored by the morning. At Badajoz, the storming was worse, and I'm not excusing the British behaviour here at all, mm -hmm. but you kind of think of the stresses and strains the people attacking. Mm -hmm. They go through a lot, but then they go overboard, and they loot it for like a couple of days, like three days, really. Yeah, and I, I, I read that, you know, people say that Wellington wasn't good at sieges. I, I just think mm -hmm. sieges are sloppy, messy things, and he... At this one, it says he cried the sight of the British that had died in the siege. He does. He walk, he walks into that breach. Right, right. And uh, he, yeah, but he looks at his own men, and it's the first of two times that I know of, and he, he openly weeps. Yeah. Personally, I think that makes him very different to Napoleon, who kind of goes, you know, um, I can I can replace these men uh, with a woman in Paris in a night. He, well. He, maybe. I'll, maybe I'll, I'll counter you on that one. Please uh, do. Please I, do. I know he weeps twice that I'm aware of. One was Marshal Lon's death. Yes. A, a second one was uh, General Goudin in Russia. So Yeah, I knew of personal, but I'm like, uh, yeah. well, Wellington's weeping for, for the normal man. True. Maybe. Maybe. True. Okay. <laughs> Probably. All right. Um, Fair enough. Fair which enough. which is unusual. You know, there there is an element to the aristocracy, to the you know, the peasantry and the soldiers, the officers. Um but I think Wellington at this point he become you know this and after also it's a little bit able to become relatable to him. Was um, he aloof with his subordinate generals and officers, or was he friendly with most of them? Very aloof, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, on on the whole, uh, his his word is is given. He doesn't have one of the really interesting ways that we can we compare Napoleon Wellington and their life and career is if you compare the headquarters and the command staff. Mm -hmm. So Wellington has what he calls his family junior officers on horseback and he rides up and down the battlefield famously on copenhagen his charger and gives orders and if he can't get there because he's got needs to go somewhere else he gives a handwritten note he's got a little pad that he can like lean on his saddle mm -hmm. or writing block and he gives a handwritten note uh, sometimes on vellum sometimes on paper or scraps and it goes off and it, it can be really really detailed information and he does that on, a, like we say today, like a tactical headquarters, a mobile up and down. He doesn't really like pitch up a tent and go, I'm here. And, and let's start laying out the maps, which is what Napoleon does. Right. Now, Napoleon does that. That means there's a central point. And if you went into a headquarters today for like a division in the British, American, you know, NATO forces, mm -hmm. you'd see something a bit more similar to what Napoleon had. Mm 
mm-hmm. which is lots of junior officers around lots of different maps doing their own task. You know, you've got one over there for logistics, one for communication, one for medicine, one for engineering. Right. Wellington doesn't. He, he He's riding around. He's thinking on the cusp. Now, it works really well for him, but mm-hmm. you've got to have that energy and that faith in yourself. It also means the problem that if something happened to Wellington, would that command star suit another general? Probably not. Would they have the full picture of what Wellington's plan was? Almost certainly not. Right. Now, I read that he rarely slept, much like Napoleon. He, he was a workaholic. He was a workaholic. He was up very early before Waterloo, for example. Uh, but he, he really, he worked very hard. And then he also got up very early to do personal correspondence. He wrote a lot to his friends, worth putting in, especially female friends. The ladies love Wellington and Wellington loved the ladies. Uh, from what I understand, his wife was the only woman he didn't really like. Well, it was his wife. Uh, yeah, poor Kitty Packenham. Um, yeah. He didn't he didn't get on that well with her. He buried her out of honour because he proposed to her. Um, he didn't get on very well with her. They they said they found each other on their deathbed, on her deathbed, because mm-hmm. um, where she was laying dying in in the Apsi and Apsi house, um, she found that he was wearing an arm locket. And it's like a chain uh, that she'd gifted him, and he'd apparently worn it every day. So mm. they kind of found themselves on her death. Uh, ironically, he got on really well with her brother, Ned Packenham, become yeah. one of his divisional commanders, and they became like best friends. Yeah. So, yeah. yes. He, he, he died at the Battle of New Orleans, correct? Was, he uh, did, yeah. New, uh, in New Orleans, he was uh, leading the charge down there in uh, War of 1812. And he, right. died, he died in uh, the winter of 1814. So, yeah, sorry. I, I just love all the backstory here. But um, no, as far as our story goes, so, all right, so Massena's out. He's replaced by Marmont, who's, you know, one of the young up-and-coming marshals. Uh, then what happens in our story? So Wellington now needs to go on the offensive. We've got the, what they call the gateway to Spain, which is Ciudad Rodrigo and Badajoz. We've secured Portugal. Mm-hmm. And so we're now going to start looking east towards Spain. Uh, he does this, and it's a long campaign of manoeuvre. Uh, on and they, Wellington and Marmont shadow each other, sometimes only a few kilometres apart. Mm-hmm. And it comes to a head that Marmont's army sees what it thinks is Wellington's baggage train going off around a village called Salamanca. It's not actually uh, Wellington's baggage train. It's the third division, which knows the fighting third, you know, very good troops. Mm-hmm. And uh, they start to spread out. And uh, Wellington's now south of this town called Salamanca, mm-hmm. and uh, there's then a gap in the, the force. And this is where Wellington, you know, attacking defensive. No, he's very good all around. He sees this opportunity that there's a gap. Time, right? He's having lunch. He's having lunch. This is this is one of my favourite stories of the Peninsula War. He's probably having lunch. I mean, this has been repeated by people who weren't there, but hey. And uh, he's, he's famously apparently eating a chicken's leg and eats it, throws it over his shoulder and says... Um, by God, that will do. And he goes and he starts, he literally starts sending orders really rapidly. He gets on his horse, charges across the plain uh, to uh, Ned Packenham, as we just mentioned, actually, his brother-in-law. Uh, Mick reaches his division, says, right, stop the advance. It's now the attack. The British cavalry turn in and they start charging. And a chap called uh, Jean Le Marchant, a French name, but actually from the Channel Islands, so a British officer who rewritten the book on swords and cavalry. He leads the charge. Wellington goes back and basically passes his own uh, aides in turning back. He's such a good horseman. I mentioned when he was growing up that he's actually outridden his own officers. Goes back and starts ordering in uh, lots of British units into the attack. And it, it exploits that gap that Marmont had. Marmont's injured uh, yep. in the cannon, yep. uh, not not obviously killed, but he, he's injured. His yep. second in command is then injured, and his third in command is injured. Yep. And uh, if it wasn't for General Clausel, I think that would have been just that. That probably would have been end game. Yeah. Um, so you're effectively without a commander for a, um, a good half an hour to an hour. There's no French commander. They're being attacked by the British, and who've caused the gap in the line? Uh, John Le Marchand actually attacks through the first line and into the second line of the, the French. Uh, Marshal um, sadly is killed uh, or out with saddle. Uh, the, Fre- the British then in the middle of the line, it's infantry on infantry, hand-to-hand combat. They capture two, possibly a third eagle. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting here. Like, all right, you know, here's Wellington. He's beaten Massena, he's beaten Marmont. Boy, Madrid should just be open for the taking. The French should run out of Spain. But that doesn't happen, does it? It doesn't go happen. Yeah, you know, they, they march into they march into Madrid. Um, mm-hmm. they, they get it. Wellington like walks around for a few days, and but it, he doesn't hold it. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's really, it feels unusual. That feels like that should be it. Cap- the capital have taken the job done. But it kind of goes back to this almost the same problem that the French have had, is that Spain is a really big country. It's very fractured. Yeah. And it's and very regional. Whether, whether it was supply problems or maybe Sult United with Suchet and Joseph and Marmont's remaining men and, mm. you know, pushed them back. But the retreat back to Portugal is quite horrid, correct? Yeah, it, it certainly turns the, the Spanish that one way or another, it doesn't it doesn't work out for the, the full support. Uh, say Suchet is something that we not really going to cover uh, because mm-hmm. the the South East Coast campaign, Wellington doesn't personally get involved with. Uh, but there's a whole French force down there. At any one point, if all the French force were able to converge, Wellington would massively lose. Oh yeah, I've got I've got no doubt the French yeah. army. French army reached 250,000. Right. Wellington's army was normally about 70 to 90,000 men. Right. And you think that well, at some point they would have all just united to push him off into the coast, but they never did that for whatever And they, and they, could, they didn't do that largely because being the guerrilla force. And mm-hmm. they're always being tied down with the guerrilla force. And if it wasn't guerrillas, it'd be small, you know, popular uprisings and things like that. Yep. Uh, so Wellington now needs to turn around and go back into, into Portugal again. And we end up with a bit of kind of table tennis going back and forwards um, for quite a lot of the campaign, really. Yeah, and I, I hear that complaint a lot when I, you know, just on, on Twitter or on, in books, like, why did it take, you know, Wellington five years to, to conquer the peninsula? And it's, it's, it's harder than it looks, in my opinion, you know, to, to have uh, not only your force, but Spanish and Portuguese and to have supplies. And it, th- there's a reason it took five years. He was fighting a good opponent and it's, it's hard terrain to cover. It massively is. It's like saying it's a it's a big country. There's a lot of elements to it. The politics, the supplies, just moving troops across this really uh, you know difficult terrain. And more troops are lost through exposure, starvation, and disease than they are through enemy action. Yeah, there's a great pie chart. Uh, Epic History TV did it recently. Yeah. Uh, really good, really good YouTube channel, and they did it, and you see it. It's most of the troops died of disease or starvation. Mm. And, yeah. that, and that starts to make you think that actually the, the battle is only part of the bigger picture. Correct. So from there, all right, so now Joseph reclaims his, his throne briefly in Madrid. Uh, Wellington's in uh, Portugal kind of refitting, resupplying. So we get to 1813, and Wellington says, all right, we're going to do one more offensive this time against the line of communications, correct? Like Yes. Yeah. So and this is he comes against Joseph Bonaparte, a, 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 officially at a protection. The Spanish throne because the King of Spain is still alive and so is the Prince Regent and uh, he catches up to him at the Battle of Vitoria. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vitoria, uh, you've got Joseph as being the de facto uh, also de jure commander but de facto you've got Jordan mm-hmm. uh, Marshal Jordan as um, de facto kind of commander on the field yep. and a lot of other people whose names come up like Derlon and, and Wellington lines up his troops. He's got uh, Thomas Graham, Hill, Picton. He's got some of the, you know, the, the big names of uh, both sides here. Yeah. Uh, and he sees the French force centered around the town. Uh, and uh, he went and div- divides his force into three major columns and effectively the divisions. And they go on wide flanking and up the middle. So they, they go on an attack and inve- inv- try to envelop the town. Yeah. Fighting across bridges, narrow bridges across rivers. And they get in, they get in amongst them and uh, they manage to force the French back. Again, you know, we're talking about the British going attacking. Yeah. Uh, French casualties are really high. Uh, Allied casualties are kind of down the middle. Um, but what they do is that they capture a lot of French guns. Yep. And this is one of those places that we have like guns all over England and stuff and bollards. And we talk about like the caption of Spain. This is one of them. Right. Uh, the other one is the French uh, baggage train is looted by the British. And this caused... Uh, it really makes Wellington go apoplectic. You know, he, yeah, he, he goes crazy. This is. I think this was his best set piece battle. The way he fell upon the French, and it would have get almost like um, we were talking at Salamanca. It would have been a total rout if what you're about to describe didn't happen. Yeah, uh, Victoria really doesn't get talked about that much, and I I really agree with you that it's a really good set piece battle. The British going on the offensive, hard won battle. You know, I'm not saying the French give up by any means. They're no. fighting across these bridges, yep. and um, but then the British fall upon what the loot that the French have already taken. <laughs> so they're, they're losing the loot, you know, yeah. Yeah. and um, this is where kind of my part of the story kind of first came in because um, Joseph Bonaparte has the best part of the Spanish royal paintings and art collection in his baggage that he's going to take back to Paris. Mm-hmm. 
um, or hate Napoleon. He was his family were terrible for looting, and he loves having all his loot in in packs. Mm-hmm. And Joseph Bonaparte is trying to fill his own palaces with the Spanish stuff. And uh, Wellington finds it. Uh, he actually sends in uh, a squadron of hussars, I believe they are, to kind of guard some of the baggage trains. And uh, they're in like, chests. They've been uh, not cut out the frames, they've broken out the frames. So the paintings are still there. Right. And uh, and he goes, well, I'm going to send this back to Britain. He gives them to his brother and to an art dealer to go, Let's let's. can you please say what we've got? He writes to the King of Spain and says, do you yeah. these back? He doesn't get any response. He looks the second time, they start to get a list of what there is, doesn't get a response. Third time, he sends like a, a list through of going, look, I've got all these amazing artists that you would have heard of. Right. And, they, and um, do, you know, do you want these paintings back? And he effectively says, oh no, you want it in battle, uh, they're yours. And that was the core of the, uh, the what's then called the Wellington Collection, but is there at Apsley House, number one London, well, that I used to work with. That's a classy move on both parties. Uh, you know, Wellington tried to do the right thing and the king said, no, no, you've earned them. And I think that's really interesting. Yeah, uh, and it's this honor and art. And, um, it's the story that goes behind them is that they're amazing paintings from actually about three Spanish uh, palaces that Napoleon, um, that Joseph Bonaparte looted, sorry. And he then brought them together, but was going to take them into Paris. They probably would have ended up in the, what's now the Louvre, then uh, the Musée Napoleon. Right. Uh, and they're, they're now back in Britain and there's like kind of a letters, there's correspondence to say, no, they belong to uh, the British Wellington, now belong to the British nation. Um, and that's not all they capture. I believe they capture uh, Jordan's baton, correct? They capture Marshal Jordan's uh, baton, and uh, that's on display in the Queen's Gallery, which is like part of Buckingham Palace. Mm-hmm. Um, that's there, and it's an amazing item to have. But they also capture something else, which was uh, Joseph Bonaparte's chamber pot, <laughs> which, which was solid silver. And uh, the the regiment that captured it now, the Hazars, uh, Kings of Hazars, they drink out of it on the anniversary of the battle. They pass, sh- <laughs> they fill it with champagne and pass it around. I assume they cleaned it before they did that. But yeah. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, okay, so from there, now this is pretty much the straw that broke the camel's back. The French are being pushed out of Spain. Uh, Jordan and Joseph are recalled, and Marshal Soult is made basically overall commander to kind of retrieve the situation correct yes so salt comes back in uh, from from porto he's he's never always fully gone away he comes in a few times uh, mm-hmm. but he's on the outskirts he comes back in as the main commander wellington uh, captures san sebastian over on the coast mm-hmm. and uh, and then we're pushing the french up to the pyrenees mm-hmm. uh, there's then actually quite a long campaign over the the autumn and winter into the Pyrenees. There's the Battle of Nive, uh, Nivelle, Bedosa, Orthez, and there's a lot of occasions where the, the French try to actually put the storm back into Spain, or you know, from northern Spain further in, uh, or and being seen off by the British, or the British are trying to actually do surprise attacks on on French held like mountain positions. Right. And it gets really brutal. It's probably one of the messiest campaigns because it's along a very wide front. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Salt ends up having to retreat. He's got a lot of conscripts in his force now. So they're, they're you know, kind of second rate troops uh, and a mix of veterans. But he's starting to realize that his, his force isn't going to be able to hold the whole of the Pyrenees right. against the British, the Portuguese and the Spanish. And at this point, well, in this early part of the campaign, the Spanish organize a lot of their guerrillas and say, look, we'll pay you really good money if you join the army. Mm. So the, the Spanish numbers swell massively with some pretty hardened individuals. Mm. And um, I believe the final battle at Toulouse was, um, occurred after Napoleon's abdication. Yeah, due to communication. Um, the, the, you know, Napoleon's abdicated, uh, but they fight at Toulouse. And um, he, gets, he gets news only the day afterwards. So Wellington has this battle, Suit has this battle both sides, and neither of them know that the war's already over. And actually Wellington sends orders, Suit leaves the city the next day, and Wellington has to like kind of chase him down with couriers to saying, look, I've got news from the French mm-hmm. that the war is over. Mm. Uh, but Suit doesn't initially believe him and then goes and hears it confirmed. Uh, so um, Toulouse is kind of, again, one of these very close run things uh, outside the city on the, on the heights of the city to kind of try to fight so the peninsula war which started with the capture of lisbon and has taken us from lisbon in and out of spain portugal yep. spain portugal ends yep. up in france yeah yeah that's a good point point. and um 
I think I mentioned this in my episode on Marshall Sult. My favorite, if I could be in any conversation, and we'll get to Waterloo in just a minute, was when Marshall Sult attended Queen Victoria's coronation in 1838. Wellington, someone grabbed them by the arm and had to the Duke of Wellington. They had never met before, as far as I know. No. And he said, I have you at last. He grabs his elbow yep. and uh, sees him. And he um, sorts a couple of years later. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, at Queen Victoria's uh, dinner, is invited to have dinner uh, with Wellington Apsey House. And apparently they try to hide as many of like the, the artworks that he's got. It's got <laughs> Napoleon in it so that there's no hard feelings because he's oh, now thought, serving you, the Bourbons. I thought you said that he, so Salt wouldn't loot them while he was there. <laughs> Um, so Salt so has a great campaign, you know, career. He goes on to be prime minister and minister yeah. of war, and he doesn't get that kind of credit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I just wish I, I wish I could have heard what they talked about. Like, yeah. So interesting. Well, Wellington and Nelson, Wellington and Salt. I, they, they, if there could be a time traveling fly on the wall, both of those would be right up there, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you wouldn't want to see one of the battles because I think you go, oh, it'd be great to see Waterloo. And then you realize that you're watching people's like kind of intestines fall out. It wouldn't, yeah. It wouldn't be a lot of fun as a as a as a witness. But to, yeah. to see those conversations and ask how their perspective, what what did, did Wellington and Salt, you know, talk about the fact that Wellington ate Salt's lunch at Porto? Right. Or, I mean, these little details. Right, or that Salt almost destroyed him at Albuera, his uh, his Beresford force. You know, Beres, like, Beres's right hand flank. You know, Salt comes in. And, yeah, there's all sorts of very close run things. Yeah, so they uh, Napoleon famously comes back. Ney says, "I'll bring you an iron cage." What a what a bad choice to choose Ney. And <laughs> uh, he, he crosses he crosses the the border, the offensive defensive, and uh, this is the last gamble. You know, Napoleon invades. The Kingdom of the Netherlands, in what's now Belgium, yep. and this is the bit that this is actually a really interesting debate on Wellington. So he's got the army of occupation, and they're drawn out across the whole what's modern day French Belgian border, mm-hmm. which was then the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And most most get bets were on that he's either going to go right and attack the Prussians in it towards Berlin direction, or he's going to go left and try to attack up towards like Calais and round towards the coast and, and cuts the British off. No one really expects him to try to go effectively towards Brussels, but between the Prussian, the Prussians and the British. Right. Uh, that was unexpected. And he kind of, you know, almost draws quite a northerly line. And Wellington's had to draw his army out. He's had to he's had to spread them and you know hedge his bets. Mm-hmm. And that's where he kind of goes, I've hedged my bets, I've keep, kept a little army back near Brussels, kind of expecting them to go towards the coast, or at least I'm prepared for if he goes towards the coast mm-hmm. on the western flank, I'm ready. But going towards the middle, it's on the British eastern flank, the Prussian western flank, mm-hmm. and he's not ready. He hears of the fighting crossing the border, and the picture takes quite a long time to board, if you, uh, to form. And if you can think that these battles are being fought at quite low levels, there's a lot of pickets, a lot of outlying actions, skirmishes. Mm-hmm. And, no, and no one really knows then, because you've got these screens of skirmishes and cavalry, where the main front is and where actually, where's Napoleon himself? Because where Napoleon's going to be is going to be the core of his army. And the Allies are kind of like still hedging the bets, not, they're, you know, they're all the different commanders aren't sure where it's going to be. And it's not the only ball, but there's the famous Duchess of Richmond's ball that's yep. that evening, uh, evening of the 15th of June. And there's been quite a few balls before that. Uh, and this is where, if you start to watch your, all your, your Vanity Fairs and Sharp and all of these books, it seems to be that everybody was at the Duchess of Richmond's ball. Right. Uh, in, in truth, it was about 200, 250 people. But if you picked up a fiction book, it's about seven, 8,000. Right. And everyone's having their parties. It's, it's a very romantic scene. You've got the wives and sweethearts. And Wellington goes anyway. He's heard that Napoleon's crossed the border. Now, I'll defend Wellington and say that uh, actually with so many of his officers going anyway, he can effectively actually listen to his officers, hear the orders and direct them. And he does do this. Yeah. He does actually take his officers to the side and say, right, I need you to go back to your unit and start to mobilize them or let's have a think about this and at one point he grabs the duke of richmond who's like a he's an officer there with no capacity uh, grabs a big map in one of the side rooms and but this is where no fear or nervousness like he doesn't panic which i think he doesn't panic yeah. he, he enjoys the evening he still has a dance with some of the ladies uh he's very calm and he apparently in mid-conversation he'll turn around and have a talk to one of the officers and go back to his conversation but in this side room, he grabs this map mm-hmm. and he picks he picks Mont-Saint-Jean 
and that's ine inevitably where the battle takes place. All right, so let us jump ahead. You know, uh, we, we know about Ligny against the Prussians. Napoleon mm -hmm. went there. Quattro Bra is more of a, a standstill against Ney. So the, the Waterloo battle, which is the battle to end all battles in the Napoleonic era. Yes, one of the most recent bat battles in history. Yep, and, and before we get into trouble with anyone on Twitter, we know the Prussians assisted in the battle victory. Huge, huge import. I, I always come down to this as an Allied victory. Right. It's not a British victory. And it's definitely not Prussians saving the British, which is the Anglo-Allied army anyway. Uh, it is an Allied effort. Wellington right. would not have fought at Mont Saint Jean if he had not been sure, or at least hoping strongly, that the Prussians were going to come to his aid. Now I say the Prussians because Blücher had been injured and he wasn't actually in command of the force overnight. Mm -hmm. So it's, he's relying upon the Prussians and the Gnais now, and then Blücher kind of comes back from his injuries to come to his aid. And I view Waterloo as a hold and trap. He draws in Napoleon and the Prussians close the door on the trap. Yep. And he's That's, flanked and Napoleon's flanked. And he's flanked. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, it, and it works very well. It's yeah. not one of Wellington's classics. He's not really done that kind of thing before. And I'll give, you know, I'll, I'll put myself in Wellington's kind of area, not his boots as such. But um, <laughs> He, he actually expects Napoleon to do one of his major manoeuvres. You know, it's one of the things that Napoleon's famous for. Mm -hmm. And he expects still the army to come around the western flank and try to get between him and the sea slightly. And he puts 17,000 troops in a town called Hal, off to the flank, who actually don't see a single bit of the fighting. They hear the cannon, but don't see anything. And those are troops that could have been better used in mm -hmm. the fighting. But Wellington's still expecting to be outflanked. But Napoleon comes straight at him. Right. And what is your thought on... It's all Marshal Ney's fault, you know, that if if you would have been more creative and done a combined force attack, it would have been a victory. Um, I think that's I, I think it's really too critical of Marshal Ney and not critical enough of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people like to say Napoleon's a military genius and the greatest general ever. Well, at this point, he basically goes off the battlefield. Mm -hmm. He doesn't leave enough clear orders. And Ney, they talk about the major cavalry charge, and they, you know, you see it in the famous film. He did move forwards with horse artillery. That's who causes the most casualties on the British squares. He, yep. He's got horse artillery, and there is infantry support. Yep. Now they actually, there's not, it's not strong enough infantry support, and they're kind of held back by the British cannon and the British counter cavalry charges. But there is a combined arm as elements. It's not as strong as it should be. Yeah, and, and I and, believe Ney requested more infantry, which Napoleon had in the Imperial Guard. But Napoleon said, well, "What do you want me to make men out of no, out of nowhere?" Yeah, and he doesn't want to commit the Imperial Guard because, right. you know, they're his immortals and they've never been beaten and right. he holds them back. So he denies that support. So I think blaming Ney is a bit of a an easy excuse to not blame Napoleon. Agreed. Uh, really. And I think it's, it's unfair on Ney. Ney, you know, yes, he could have done better because he could have won. But actually, he, he did very well with what he got. Yeah. So the British strength starts to, like, the Allied strength, I should stress, it starts to deplete. Yeah, and, 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 and Ney Wellington, sees this, and he thinks it's the, he thinks it's the start of a, a, a general retreat back. Yep, and and Wellington said it was a close run battle, the closest run thing you've ever seen. It, um, that's it, and he you know he's reliant upon waiting, and the, one of the reasons that this kind of this myth that the Prussians had come to save Wellington, even though it'd been decided on the seventeenth of June that the battle would definitely be at Mont Saint Jean with the Prussian headquarters, was that the Prussians uh, were actually a little bit delayed in their marching. They were disorganized still from Lingy, mm -hmm. and they took a little bit longer to arrive than they should have done. Yeah. But they were vital in being there. And that's where you have to kind of, I know it's really quite boring, isn't it? To kind of be the, be the balance, but that's what Waterloo is. It's yeah. an amazing victory. Yeah, but it's it's a trap and hold or hold and trap. Yeah, it's, and it, it's an allied victory. The British army is made up of many forces. We call it a British army, but it wasn't. It was allied. It had Dutch, Nassau, yep, Dutch, yep, Dutch yep. the and, Dutch included the Belgians, Nassau, yeah. Germans, Hanoverians and uh, Brunswick and loads of different nations. And we, we inevitably call it British army. But actually, it wasn't. It was an allied force. And Wellington, you know, it, it wasn't his most perfect battle. You know, the cavalry uh, overran and were counterattacked by the French cavalry. Yeah. And, you know, even Wellington himself, when asked, you know, who's the greatest general of all time, he said Napoleon in this age and any age. So Yeah, it, it was it was incredibly close. You know, he says it's the nearest wrong did, thing I ever did see. Um, it, he didn't, you know, there's lots of points that it could have been, you know, at the, at the falling of La Haye Sainte, uh, mm -hmm. it was called the crisis about 6 p.m., uh, you know, the French guns become very close and the 
for British positions. Hugamons, you know, stormed and, and held and then you know, kind of probably stormed two or three times. Mm -hmm. uh, and each time they, they held, you know, the famous closing of the gates, they say they saved Europe. Well, just to wrap up, because um, we're running short on time, uh, from there, obviously, Wellington uh, goes back to England. He becomes prime minister not once, but twice, right? Twice, yes. He has a, he has a premiership uh, for just over two years uh, with his second in command uh, being Robert Peel. Uh, together, they changed a lot of uh, convict laws, uh, repealed a lot of uh, items that could have formed an execution, and Peel sets up with one of support um the the peelers as they become known the london's met police uh, and they and they've changed catholic emancipation so the catholics in britain are second class citizens because of basically the gunpowder plot to simplify yeah. things and uh, they change that so they become uh, have given rights in, in britain uh they they, they are asking for full reform of the house of laws and voting and that's on the rise the nation wants it wellington you know he's a tory with the capital and the conservative with the capital c and he says, no, that's a step too far, even though he stares down uh, the king to say, get Catholic emancipation through, who really dislikes Catholics. Well, he says, I don't want to do that before. So he, um, the nation basically speaks uh, in one loud voice. They smash his windows uh, with, uh, with stones and manure. And uh, Wellington's forced to put iron shutters on the, um, the front of Apsley House. And that's how he gets his nickname, the Iron Duke. Uh, there you go. I didn't know that. So it comes from, it comes from there. There's a riot in London, and he has to put iron shutters on. So he retires from political life in 1846, and then passes at the age of 83 in 1852. And I just want to touch briefly on his funeral. It, from what I understand, it was massive. It was huge. I think proportionally, the number of people he visited was one of the largest ever. He died at a little place called Warmer Castle down on the Kent coast of England, a beautiful little castle. Again, I strongly uh, suggest people visit and they've created one of the rooms or well, the room that he died in to look like how he was when he died. He was in he was in the cot bed. He didn't always sleep in this cot bed. There's this room that went around that he always slept like he was on campaign. It was just this one place didn't have his normal bed. In it. Uh, he unfortunately suffered a stroke overnight. Um, he was brought into his armchair and uh, they, he then was asked if he'd like a cup of tea. And he said, yes, if you please. And they were the last words he spoke. By the time his tea was brought to him, he slipped away. Mm. Uh, so it's a very British way to go. You know, he, he dies waiting on a cup of tea. <laughs> uh, the Queen Victoria kind of decreed that it was going to be a large funeral, it had to be voted on by Parliament. Right. And Prince Albert, uh, Queen Victoria's husband, uh, personally oversaw this funeral. It involved this massive carriage that's like as big as an articulated lorry uh, that was partially made from melted down French cannon and covered in French uh, flags and cuirasses and swords. Mm -hmm. And that was towed with a coffin inside that actually dropped down in the middle and turned around. Uh, it was towed by the um, horses that used to carry the brewery beer around London. Wow. And, and the funeral procession was miles and miles long. They, they planned the route and they had to make it longer for the amount of people that wanted to see it. Uh, people sold seats out there, like first and second story windows for quite a lot, proportionally quite a lot of money, like week's wages. Um, so people could lean out of their like bedrooms effectively, pay, pay to have these seats. It was probably the, large, the, probably the largest funeral that's ever been witnessed in person in British history. Uh, they talk about the uh, Nelson State funeral, this eclipsed that. And then we talk about, you know, uh, the Queen's funeral very sadly, very recently, uh, yeah. Lady Diana's, the Queen yep. Mother's. Yep. Uh, for the amount of people that were in London, you know, people died in the crush to see it. Yeah, yeah. This is how big, and it and it mattered. Uh, Queen Victoria on seeing the coffin broke down in tears. It, yeah. This was a, this was a, this was the end of an era. Yeah. This was the this was effectively drew the line in the public knowledge of the Napoleonic era, the Georgian era, and this really held in now. You know, Wellington had seen one of the first uh, railways open up in the Liverpool, Liverpool Manchester Railway up north, started the steam engine, and this is now like draw the line. Let's look forward to the end of the century and innovation and look away from you know the beginning of the 1800s right. uh, and the warfare there. And we now look towards kind of the peak of the British Empire, <laughs> Industrial Revolution, uh, and this innovation and Victorian technology. Right. Well, I think that's a great point for us to wrap up, Marcus. I, I, I really appreciate you being on the show and discussing the great Duke of Wellington.